Thank you. Right. Well, welcome to the 2020 meeting of the Energy Charter Independent Accountability Panel, and thank you for the disclosure from Osgood. Uh, in starting the meeting, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So um, I think you know the panel, but I'm Claire Petrie, the Chair, uh, Cassandra Goldie, the CEO of ACOS, and Andrew Richards, the CEO of the EUAA. Um, I'm going to pass to you in a moment to just talk to your disclosure uh, and highlight any particular parts that you'd really like to draw to our attention, both positive and negative in terms of where you've come, in terms of the charter, where you were last year and, and where you'd hope to be by now. But before I do, the panel wanted to just acknowledge, as we have to all other um, CEOs, that we, we understand that it has been an unprecedented year like we just haven't known with um, fire floods and now the COVID pandemic. Um, we know it had an impact and that you'll probably want to talk about that, but also we want to hear about non-COVID stuff as well. Uh, so if um, you'd like to just talk to your disclosure um, and then we'll open it up for general discussion and questions. So um, over to you, Richard. Thanks, Claire. And I have Rob Amford-Lewis, our Chief Customer Officer with us, and Selena as well, our Head of Government Operations or Government Relations. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't make it last year, so it's good to turn up this year. So um, Again, you sort of mentioned how big a year it was, and look, there's no doubt about that. For us and everyone, it's just been a humongous year. Um, it's in so many ways, and I will touch on a few of those impacts as we go through, but equally I'll address the questions that you've raised as well, Claire. Um, just, you know, a bit about Ausgrid. I won't spend a great deal of time, but, you know, 1.8 million customers or customer connections, that serves about 4 million customers. Um, 1.6 million of those connections are residential and about 200,000 business. Um, we have a range of uh, partners, whether they be retailers, councils, uh, ASPs, etc. I think in our patch, about 20% of Australia's GDP comes from. Uh, we have 16% of all Australian jobs, probably a bit more from that percentage now if you throw in Victoria. Um, about 1,200 schools and about 100, 105 hospitals. So it's a big chunk of Australia and a big chunk of Australia's engine. I think, you know, to go into your point about how big a year it was, if you just look at some of the stats for us, um, we've handled over 265,000 phone, email or social media inquiries over the year. Um, that's uh, up about 7% on our, in our previous numbers. We've handled about over 6 million visits to our website. A uh, big focus on our website's been the our outage map, and we'll get to that. But about 80% of those uh, visits to our website, are, of those 6 million, were on the outage map. Uh, we've had a, an incredible 165,000 direct service requests. That's sort of ranging from pole inspections, street light, veggie requests, um, and that's up about 30%. We've had more than 14,000 claims come into our business. Uh, and that's reflecting the storms, uh, which it's about 130 per cent up on previous years. Uh, we've had 6,300 complaints. That's up only about 9 per cent. And considering the year, um, it's 9 per cent's not bad, really, all those other stats, uh, but equally much more to do for us as a business, as we'll get to. Um, for us, we see the year um, yeah, full of challenges, but equally it is full of opportunities. Um, we've learned a lot about ourselves. We've learned a lot about our customers. Uh, and we know there's much more to do. Uh, and I think in each one of the big chunks of disasters that we've dealt with, um, I think we've come to a better place uh, and we're actually doing better stuff for our customers and better stuff for the community. 
for us, I just do want to focus on a couple of issues. The first is safety. It was raised at our last disclosure, but we had the uh, unfortunate and tragic fatality of one of our employees in April 2019. Uh, following that, we then put on hold our, all our live line work. And for us, uh, that's you know well over 200 uh, tasks are done live. What that means is that to work and de-energised, it's uh, effectively we have to disconnect customers when we do the work. So we're actually creating an impost uh, on customers by, by not working live. Um, but we took the view that we needed to ensure that our community and our workers were safe, and we had to do a full risk assessment of all those processes to ensure that happened. Um, so over the year, we've worked through uh, each of those live tasks, and we've done it in a collaborative way. <laughs> Um, so we've set up a um, a work consultative, a live work consultative committee. We had the ECA representation on that, which was great. We had the regulators on that. Uh, we had the CEOs of the other businesses, uh, network businesses around New South Wales on that. Uh, and I think that was one of the good things, uh, many good things out of the live work pause that we did, that we actually took that collaborative way to get the industry thinking about how it can be safer and still service customer needs. Um, we're now expanding that to uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand, such that we can actually expand the learnings that we have done uh, and the processes that we've put in place. And we're running industry forums uh, around, yes, they'll be virtual, uh, but virtual industry forums so that we can actually uh, collaboratively, as an industry, take a step up in our safety, which I'm sort of really proud of that. Uh, I'm really proud of those processes. Uh, and yes, that has stemmed from a, a tragic event. So I, I think that's a really good outcome. In terms of the other sort of crisis management for us, you know, yes, it's, uh, or we've sort of, started with safety issues, we then went into storms. So you'd recall if you're in Sydney, uh, you didn't have power for a fair while. So in Sydney, we had serious storms in November, of which we had over, I don't know, 70,000 customers off. Uh, and then we had the bushfires, of which wasn't as big an impact on our business, but again, collaboratively, we were helping other businesses uh, to respond. And then we backed straight into the February storms where we had 150,000 customers off, some up to 10 days. Um, so they're huge storms. And I don't know if you saw the pictures in the northern suburbs, uh, but they were huge trees that were just everywhere. And uh, issues for us and customers, for that matter, is just getting access to their homes uh, equally as well as getting their power back on. So I think for us, again, the, the learnings around that were quite significant. Um, we learnt that we're pretty good at responding to a storm, but our communication can be much better. Um, we provide a lot of communication, but I think our, our surveys and customer feedback on how we actually worked in those storms was that we provided communication, but it wasn't really the most targeted and relevant communication. Uh, it wasn't the most timely and it wasn't the most useful. Um, so simple things of just saying that you won't have power by dinner time. Um, we weren't doing that previously. We were saying, you know, with an engineering type response, I suppose, you won't get your power back for two or three hours, but we weren't targeting the fact, well, how do people, how do customers manage around their lives when they haven't got power and how do we give them some certainty? And giving them certainty around not having power is as important uh, as giving certainty around having power. So. Like we, we can do so much better in, in the real time basis, and we'll probably touch on that a bit more. Uh, in terms of COVID for us, um, and like everyone, that's I think ev every person is, is actually touched in some way, uh, and each and every one of us has a story, and all those stories are relevant and correct. Uh, and it's actually operating a business through those uncertainties and stress levels. I think it's uh, a learning for us was the need to reach out to all our business and all our employees uh, and uh, ensure that their families and everyone were being checked in on. 
Uh, and I think that was an important thing for us and the wellness issues associated with my people uh, and my families uh, and uh, my workers' families are just a big learning for us. Um, specifically, the sorts of things that really proud of that we did put in place uh, was our Give Us a Wave campaign. I don't know if you saw that. I hope you did. Um, but that, that stemmed from uh, interactions we were having when we we're trying to do our critical works uh, with customers and some it got to one extreme where customers um, came out and coughed on our employees and it was about the fact and it's understandable like it's that action's not understandable but the uh, angst is, is understandable and and it's you know they're trying to run a business from home and we're coming along saying we have to disconnect you to do some critical works um, so we thought we needed to work with the other businesses and and sort of drive campaigns to give some air cover and understanding of why we were doing that work. Uh, that's why we use the phrase, you know, give us a wave, but also critical works. So that was pretty important for us. I think it was also the other sort of collaborative aspect of that was uh, with anyone who would listen to us, uh, we would like sort of the acknowledgement of our work as critical work as an essential service. You know, mm. if you recall through COVID and it's still there, but we're very strong to acknowledge the frontline workers, the health workers, um, but we're less strong to acknowledge those who are out there still putting themselves at risk in a COVID world to help critical works and get that done. So I think that was a key thing of us trying to be a better business and work more collaboratively, I suppose, across all the industry and, and government and policy sectors. So again, pretty proud of that. Um, working together, I suppose, with the other businesses and retailers putting in those network relief packages, pretty important stuff um, that we know we're in a privileged position in that we are still providing a business and we're still providing a service. Um, yes, we've got lots of stresses and pressures and financial presses, but relative to some, relative to many, we are privileged. Um, so it's important that we sort of lean in. And I think working with the other businesses, working with the retailers to put those packages in place, whether they be deferrals or rebates, the capacity rebates associated with small business, putting those in place. And to see that, you know, the number of 17,000 deferrals and, and, and those 6,000 rebates applied, to see those issues and options accessed, I think was a real plus. So we're very uh, excited is not the right word. Proud, I think, is the better word um, that we actually did go and put those things in place um, and be part of the community and lean in. Richard, uh, could I just um, pause you there? Because I think um, you obviously want to say more, but I think that will come out in the discussion. So, <laughs> Was I going on too long, was I? No, no, no. <laughs> I, I'm just always conscious that we don't have a lot of time and um, I want to uh, make sure that we have a, a, a dialogue. So if it's okay, I might um, just go to Andrew and then we'll come back to you and make sure you get to say everything you want to say. But let, let's move to the next stage at this um, point, if that's all right. Happy with that, Claire. Mm. Okay, thanks. So, Andrew. Uh, yeah, th thanks, um, uh, Richard, Rob, and Selena. Look, uh, just on a personal note, Richard, my father was a linesman for 35 years. Um, so, I, I understand and empathise uh, with a lot of what you've said around effectively energy industry being one of the first responders in these sorts of crises. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, you know, sometimes people don't actually respect that so i can i've got a, a very close personal connection to that kind of situation so um can I, i'm also interested uh, congratulations on the uplifting communication both in quantity and quality and it's interesting because i we actually recognize that that with that occurred and it's also it's good to hear that you're thinking you need to do more and so you're constantly having that feedback loop which is really important so uh, i think that's that's a really positive as well a couple of questions then. I mean, you, you, you're really working hard to embed the principles of the of the of the, um, the charter inside your business. But a business like yours particularly has so many third parties that impact it and work with it, and also have touch points with the community. What are you what, what are you doing to make sure that the principles of the charter 
filter out to those those other other parties that you work with in the same way that you'd be working on on health and safety how how are you uh, in, trying to impact those other businesses with with those charter principles yeah like, and, and that's a great question I'm, I'm glad that you do have that linesman background um, <laughs> it's good to see uh in terms of the uh principles of the charter and how we're embedding it and how we're actually uh sort of making that one of us uh the, the first i suppose is is improving our understanding of our customers um we have come off a, a lowish base i would say in what is a full understanding of our customers and we i think osgrid um is like many distribution businesses but probably a bit on the worser end uh in that we've been a very engineering uh build stuff business as opposed to a service and understanding our customer business and that's the thing we're really trying to shift um so we're the first port of call for us is to understand their customers better get a better political base understand what where they are what they what drives them what what are their desires what are their needs and what are their wants uh we're better in doing that through as i said data but also through surveys through our nps uh our rep track and all those measures as well and we're trying to build up that knowledge bank uh, of our understanding of our customers and what they desire and want. Um, I think that feeds directly into opportunities to improve and that then leads to action plans uh, that we implement across the business. Um, the second key thing that, that drives me that I've sort of taken out of the energy charter is the, the need to work together. I, I, we historically and i've probably been a party to it that we've been a bit siloed in how we approach issues um i worry about you know my business uh and less about the industry and less about the customers and the community so i think the desire and the sort of questions that i ask of my exec group and then the exec group and rob and selena ask of their teams is well how can we work together on this? How can we get other people involved or other businesses and other stakeholders involved in A, recognising the issue, B, solving the issue, uh, and, and C, just doing it all together? So I think that for us uh, were two of the key principles that feed and drive how we change this place mm -hmm. and you're seeing that filter through to say when you engage subcontractors or, or or other third parties as well uh look it's short short answer is yes but it's still a journey for us so um are we uh, how we engage we've had sort of subcontractor forums uh where we're getting, seeking both feedback and input we brought all uh, our councils together i've forgotten the total number of councils that we have over 30 uh, over 30 councils and and um we've put ourselves to the to the sword i suppose and said well how have we gone and mm. yeah we, we didn't have enough time in those meetings yeah. um so we you know we've learned a lot that we're not uh you know working together appropriately and even you know things like our scheduling is like we schedule for ourselves um okay but no uh we have to schedule knowing the impacts of our scheduling on the scheduling of those other parties and the you know rectification works and all those sorts of issues as well. So um, we're down that journey. We're by no means complete. Uh, much more to do. Many more uh, learnings to have at virtually every level for us. Mm -hmm. Andrew, just just one thing for, for for me to add. I think that the very step of us taking that that step down the path with ASPs, retailers, councils. Uh, contractors, all those people who make up the community that serve our community and saying, well, we've got it wrong. What do we need to change? We're now doing NPS surveys more regularly. If you if we, if you haven't had resolution, we're going to call you back. You can opt for, for the CCO to call you back if you, if, if you want. Uh, the way that we engage them and, and, um, and open a d dialogue about how to be better for our community takes away a lot of that, that motivation to blame each other, which I think has been, as Richard says, um, pointing fingers at other people doesn't deliver a better outcome. Um, and I think we're, we're killing that slowly. Um, we need to be a lot better, but I'm on the start of that journey, but it's, it's helped. Yeah. And, and, and sorry, Andrew, but the, we just put in a measure 
like it seems, which is a uh, number of uh, cancelled planned outages. Now, you'd think that's a pretty, you know, boring measure. Um, but our feedback from the councils and the ASPs was that we just stuff up their work programs when we cancel an outage. Yes, we've got reasons for ourselves, but, you know, by having that measure now that comes to me, that, you know, I, I then look at the uh, operations group and say, well, why did we cancel? Why, you know, what are the reasons? How did you communicate it? How did you work together to solve that problem? And how did, in the rescheduling, how was it done? So that's just stemmed out of these processes. Mm -hmm. So build, building up your understanding of your role in the whole economic ecosystem, I think that's that's a really important important point. It's uh, energy is a driver for business and driver of the economy and understanding how that impacts. I've, look, it's you to be congratulated on taking those steps. It's probably some white knuckle moments, but... Um, <laughs> there was, Andrew, there, and, and there's probably going to be more to come, actually. There will be more to come. Well, I think um, in, in the end of the day, it's uh, consumers and other parties should recognise, and I'm sure they do, that uh, the end result should should be uh, should be very worthwhile. So just just on that, then, my, my generally my second question is it's very probably going to be more relevant to you guys than a lot of others is net zero emissions by 2050. Um, and you know the, the the there's two aspects to it. There's a negative and a positive. So the negative could look at as we transition to net, net zero emissions by 2050 that the impact of stranded assets or underutilisation of assets or overbuild of assets and how that could actually blow back onto consumers with higher bills. Um, so how, how are you thinking about that negative? But also there are positives out of this. And Rob, here's an opportunity for you to talk about community batteries. Um, <laughs> the, there's lots of opportunities there too. So how, how, how do we protect consumers from the negative, the blow, potential blowbacks? And then how, how do we also engage consumers in a, in a positive conversation to bring them along for the journey so that you know, we, we can maintain affordability, reliability and sustainability? Yeah, no, and they're, they're great questions. Like for us, like we don't have a target of net zero for, from 2050, but we have got a target space for our, uh, what is it, 8%? of the overall business and 43% of our controllable if you take out the losses of reduction by 24. Yep. Um, so we're, uh, A, I'm proud that we've actually put a target out there. Um, most other businesses you'd be speaking to, if you question them pretty hard, you'd find they haven't got one. Yep. Um, secondly, we put out our first sustainability report uh, this year. Again, we're proud of that. Um, we think we need to be in the public record standing by what we're doing uh, at all levels. It's not just emissions, it's diversity, it's it's all those other aspects, our F SFX, all those sorts of issues. So uh, that's a, a real plus in terms of, well, okay, what's it mean to go to zero emissions or lower emissions and how do we manage those negative impacts? Um, I, I see our grid as being in a very good positive position, I suppose. The future for Ausgrid is more about, and I think we use the term internet and e energy, and it's it's about being uh, technology agnostic. And actually, for to get to zero emissions, it's going to be no one solution. It's a whole heap of central renewables. It's it's batteries. It's uh, uh, localized renewables. It's DER. All those sorts of issues. But actually, you need a grid like Ausgrid to monetize and make that work. Um, so we see there's little stranding. Um, we're not a transmission business that ha is connected to a, a, a Liddell or a, a coal-fired generation, which is going to have A-stranded connection assets and B-stranded transmission. We're much more integrated and looped and less central, if that makes sense, less central contingency. So therefore, there is a little downside. So for us, how do we ensure that customers are getting bang for dollar and lower dollars and affordability going forward? For us, we have to make our grid uh, accessible, relevant, uh, and the economics of the shared asset flowing through to customers. I think the worst thing would be to have a, an Optus and Telstra dual build of a fibre or a dual build of a network. Um, so the way we can avoid that is not by regulating it, it's by ensuring that we're affordable now and we're relevant and we're, we're affordable in the future. So that's how we think about that stuff. Okay. Many, of the, many of the things that we're doing, you know, 
tariff reform that we've worked with um, with, with you and, and other customer advocates on, uh, the community battery. Um, they're all about trying to find the way to, for the grid to support that transition at lowest cost. So sharing is what a grid is. We're all sharing uh, the use of a, a common community asset. And that common community asset, if used um, effectively, reduces cost for everyone. So I think we feel optimistic about the role that the grid can play and the role that we can play in leading um, uh, the discussion about the grid's role itself. So, yeah, but we've got to stand up. Yeah. And, I, and I think our target is standing up. Yeah. Um, and, and we want to encourage others to do that. Yeah. I mean, that, that comment of remaining relevant, I think that's really important. So, yeah. So, if I may, just um, to pick up um, Richard um, from Andrew's question um, on the um, community battery front um, and sort of the forecasting of the impacts of distributed energy um, arrangements and the equity issues, you know, the, the vulnerable consumers you are really well placed to take a particular role in grappling with that very, in my view, urgent issue, actually, um, that, you know, if we don't put equity in the, the heart of that agenda, it will become a massive problem. Could you just take us through the work that you've got underway at the moment on that front and how you are looking at the issues of vulnerability, those that are renters, for example, um, you know, and, and the future that future planning that you've got in place to try and tackle that. Okay, thanks, Cassandra, and I'll probably ask Rob to help me out here as well. Yeah. But in 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 terms of um, the equity issues and the DER and where it's all going and and what's how do we see that and how do we play in that, um, like. It, I totally agree with you. It's fundamental that the equity issues be sort, sorted. We see tariff reform as being a big chunk of that. We also recognise that tariff reform is like tax reform. It doesn't generally happen. Um, it doesn't happen because there are winners and losers. Uh, there are equity issues and it's very hard. Um, so the way we're approaching that is um, recognising that, seeing it's a long-term issue, making sure we know who the winners and losers are we document that but i think it's all about a forward look rather than a backward look we in my sort of parlance i see electric vehicles as being one of those big changes that are going to happen in the grid which has the potential of bringing all those equity issues to the fore again uh, and i believe we shouldn't I would be derelict in my duty if we let that come in and it happens like the solar PV issues. Yep. So I think I've got to make sure and we're pretty focused in this business to make sure that we get that forward looking changes such that we um, future proof the business from these debates and the community from these debates in the future. So that that's a big issue for us um, in terms of the community battery Rob will speak to, but uh, in how we're addressing our vulnerable customers, um, the first thing is, as I touched on earlier, is understanding who they are and where they are and what they are. Um, and, you know, clearly we have vulnerable customers financially. We have uh, vulnerable customers that have been made more vulnerable through a COVID world. We have uh, vulnerable customers who are disadvantaged in some other way, whether they be life support customers and those sorts of issues. So we're sort of focusing on each of those segments and mapping out specific programs and working collaboratively with other businesses to figure out how we can fix that, uh, how we can improve that. Um, just taking the life support customers, that's a big issue for us. We've got 37,000 uh, life support customers registered in on our network. Um, so we've got new targeted programs. We've sat and surveyed most of them. We're trying to get uh, all their phone numbers so that we can give contacts. Some don't want to do that. Uh, and you have to recognise that, but I think we're at about 90% uh, yeah, so, yeah, uh, of good. the numbers got, which is good. It means we can call them when there's an outage. We can call and check in on them. When we had those long storm outages, our, we had door knocking of our vulnerable customers. We actually rang in on our vulnerable customers um, to make sure they were right. We provided some generators for some vulnerable customers. So it's a matter of knowing about them and then working through. Yep. 
Um, just a couple of a couple of comments on the community battery. I think the the fact that DER has been uh, really the the uh, reserve for those who are homeowners uh, and those who can afford often afford the upfront co capital costs. You know, we see that as a as a problem for engagement uh, with the new world of DER and distributed resources. And so, the community battery for us allows people to access you know the benefits of a battery without having to make the upfront capital cost. The costs them share themselves are shared amongst a number of different users of the battery. Not everyone uses the battery at the same time, so uh, the battery can deliver more value than a, an individual's battery could. And the battery can deliver value to the grid, um, the network, our network, the transmission grid. It can provide value up into the FCAS uh, market. So really, it's, an, it's a community asset which can uh, provide access to people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford access, and it can reduce costs for the whole ecosystem. So. For us, that sits really in the sweet spot of how we think about sharing and benefiting you know, our community, uh, what our role is, and also it, it, it's really aligned with what the Energy Charter is all about as well. So uh, tick, tick, tick for us. Specifically on the rental customers, like we have not done a, a, a great deal and, and we sort of haven't got those answers yet. Um, so we you know, see that as a sort of a focus area uh, for the, the next period is to... Right. Yeah, I wondered about that, Richard, and I just wanted to encourage you in this sort of trial process to have an eye to the systemic reforms needed, you know, um, because as much as possible as a leadership role, uh, the investment you're making in this, um, you know, we're, we're not on the front foot in this one, I think. We're on the back foot. So yeah. I really welcome your comments on the, you know, the um, electricity and the vehicle side of it because I think that's exactly right um, and so just um, you know the rental customer is a huge part of the concern we've got from an equity point of view so um, and it might be just uh, because there are the two parts for me the DER discussion and the community batteries but then just going to the broader vulnerability strategy that you've referenced in your disclosure um, we're very interested in um, trying to get some consistency in the metrics being used to do the segmenting of who mm. and then to be very explicit about the specific strategies that are being put in place to respond to those particular needs. So, again, um, my sense is you're at an early stage of that work. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's a fair summary. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, and we certainly haven't... Um, uh, we certainly haven't got access to that centralization and that standardization of those measures. Mm. Um, and but yeah. gee, it's a good point. Like I, I do think um, it'd be much better for all, especially the vulnerable customers, if if we could actually work together and make those definitions clear. Yeah. Um, so we will take that on. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the other. So yeah. just going to say, I think the other thing that that for us as a sector is that typically we've looked at vulnerable customers or, or, or hardship issues as being a customer relationship uh, management exercise and therefore it's a retailer issue. And of course, uh, that's often the case in regard to, to many issues such as you know managing bill, bill payments and those sort of things. That is a retailer issue, but there are actually, there's no excuse for us to think about how we can contribute. Right? So the life support customer, we can do so much and we identified that through our customer transformation and which is shared about the share the things that we've done. The other thing that we realize is we do have direct financial relationships with end customers. When it comes to bushfire defects and a lot often people living in the country don't realize they own their own assets. And so the first time they realize is when we come and tell them that they're non-compliant with a, with bushfire uh, legislation and they've got to change and they've got to get them fixed or we're going to come in and fix them for them. Um, and that creates quite often quite a significant bill for people who often, especially at the moment, can't really face that. So we saw that and we've addressed that problem uh, as well. We've got hardship policies in place. We get there much earlier. We, six months earlier, we started with communication with our, our bushfire affected um, um, as customer customers who own assets. Uh, and that's been a tremendous outcome. So it just shows if we focus at things, we can deliver a much better customer experience yeah. and a much, um, much less stressful um, customer experience as well, because um, we work with the customer and get great outcome. But we need to mirror that approach, as Richard said, across you know the 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 broader suite of activities that we that we engage with, with customers. 
Do you think that there would, um, in the better together part of the charter work, um, do you think that the, um, the segmenting of vulnerability, you know, that particular metrics, is that something that is being considered? And do you think there would be strength in getting some consistency to it? Or, or do you see there's a higher priority? One of, that's one of our questions is over this next 12 months, given the new environment that we're all in, and it's been a pretty tough year, right? Mm. Um, nobody wants to keep people busy for, you know, little value. We've got to focus on the, yeah. the biggest issues that the industry should be working on together. And is that one of them? Yeah, like... Uh, I see it as an equal priority that like we've got we've got a lot of high priorities yeah. um, and I'm not one that would drop off the vulnerable customers and us being better and how we serve and deal and understand those customers. So I see it as an equal high priority. Uh, I think we as an industry and Osgrid stands ready to do that is to assist uh, in whatever ways we can. We need to do more. Um, so it is an important priority. Like it, it goes to the high, you've got the vulnerable customers, then above that is, well, the overall community trust uh, level of A, the sector, and B, my business. Um, and I think those are one-to-one. -one. We need to address and bring the vulnerable customers along this journey with us, uh, and therefore we as an industry can become better than a bank. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I think that, well, I know this is being taped, isn't it? I'm not going to mention banks. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I think it's important that the sector and the energy charter is a big chunk of that, that the sector, the industry comes together to solve these issues. Yeah, because the, from the customer's point of view, you're all in it, you're all in it together. That's, yep. the, yeah. that's the reality, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we are. Um, I'll just Claire, and then I'll then I will I'll come back to, come back to you. I just want, I picked up you've um, created this first customer advocate um, role, and and how that's working in the embedding it in the governance of the business. You know, right in the heart of the governance of the business, um, and how that's been going. Right. Okay. I'll answer it in two ways. The first is yes, we did create that role, but even creating Rob's role as the chief customer officer it's that has a whole heap of flow on effects. One is that customer in the title is a good thing and that's just not titles, titles, but they matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means the business is focusing on it because of that role that Rob then sits on our investment governance committee now, where and as a customer, as a customer voice. So that's a plus. Rob sits as uh, on other investment committees as well, in our IT committee as a customer voice. So I think that's positive. I think the creation of the customer advocate role is about giving a, a point of resolution uh, for our complaints. In, rather than coming into a, a blamange of Osgrid, uh, there's actually a pr formal process that will go through and a customer advocate that can actually solve those issues. And that individual reports to Rob. Yep. So Rob, do you want to add? Look, from my perspective, it's been a, a really good learning. Uh, again, that we well, we looked at the Banking Royal Commission, and, and this was some of the recommendations that, that came came out of, of that. We thought we don't need to wait for a Royal Commission to learn from from this, so we put it in place. The um, the great thing for me is the the cases that we need to learn from bubble up into the customer advocate. Those things where you where things have gone wrong, they can't be resolved easily. They get to the customer advocate. That means they get to me. And more often than not, it means that we get to learn from that. And I think we're looking at customer complaints, those get, that get escalated as the most valuable tool from which to learn from in terms of our transformation towards being more customer centric. So uh, it's been incredibly powerful uh, for me, the, the, the challenge that that role brings uh, to me and to the exec team, um, but also the visibility and transparency, transparency, which gives us all the ability to learn and, and change. So uh, culturally it's been, uh, brilliant. Very happy with uh, how that's worked out. Just to add to that, I suppose most of our measures are average or or aggregate. Yep. And by Rob's point is we need knowledge of the tail uh, and those those issues that are really causing the problems. And that's what this sort of role brings yep. to the table and brings that's it up it. to the exec group. That's it. 
great. Thank you. And just Thanks. that comment there that complaints are a valuable tool is is really says a lot, I think. Uh, Andrew, the, one of the things that we, we, we're most excited by, we're most worried by, but, but most excited by is the callbacks we give where we, when we serve our customer and they say that their issue has not been resolved, they have the option to ask you for a callback. And um, if they're, you know, um, partner partners, you can opt, opt for line management or even the CCO callback. And um, we're going to roll that out with other execs to do callbacks because the learnings that I've had about the impacts of the you know, pain and suffering that you create a partner or a customer uh, through a, you know, often a, a failed process um, really does help drive momentum for change, um, which I'm seeing um, and really happy to see. Richard, um, in terms of under knowing your customers, we've been talking about vulnerable customers, and I think we've probably emphasised the residential part, but I would imagine you would have thousands of small businesses in your within your footprint, um, many of whom may even be trading insolvent at the moment um, under the you know, new um, allowances. Um, do you have a feeling for your small business customer cohort and what's happening there? Uh, yeah, and we do have a feeling, and yes, you're right, there are some struggling individuals. It's it's um, less so than it was two or three months ago, if that may, like at New South Wales is in a better position than Victoria in the way uh, the business suffering is going and the way the, the economy is working. We use a measure of the capacity reset. So there's a capacity charge on our small businesses. Uh, and we then took the initiative of, of saying, well, if your capacity charge uh, drops by uh, below 75%, uh, you're eligible for a rebate. So that gives us a feel for the sorts of numbers. Yep. That was around 6,000, was it? I think so, yep. Yeah, about 6,000 of the small business uh, actually accessed that rebate. So that gives you a, a feel uh, for the number, so that's 6,000 out of a couple of hundred. Um, so that gives you a feel for the really pointy end of that. Uh, in terms of our other interactions, it just comes through our surveys, is that? Um, yeah, so I mean, the other thing we, we do see is um, volume and energy demand from different customer segments across the different, and we do it by um, sector and by size as well. So, you know, we did see that there was a pretty uh, significant hit to, you know, arts and recreation and, and um, those sorts of sectors, hospitality that we, you'd expect, often small businesses. Um, and, at, you know, beginning of the pandemic, they were down 65, 70 percent uh, across the board so you know in that there's some people doing it really tough like nothing's happening um we've seen that really recover so they're probably about 10 or 15 percent down now so a, a substantial uh, recovery in terms of their consumption but that that re consumption recovery doesn't necessarily mean that their you know business has recovered and their revenue has recovered so mm, um, yes. Yeah, and so we see we see in our surveys that um, affordability uh, of energy is just still top of the list, especially in that subsegment, um, because uh, they're the ones that are doing it toughest, uh, and that's why the capacity reset really focused on that 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 group. Just by n the nature of the the hurdle to access it, it, it really did self-select groups uh, customers in that sort of smaller business hospitality type um, sector. Gyms, gyms were a big one. Gym, gyms were a big one as well. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't heard so much about um, the level of bad debt risk and what plans are in place to deal with that. We assume it's big. Um, any comments, further comments on that? Uh, yeah, I'm... I suppose the thing, the thing for, from... <laughs> We're about to leave him to go on. Uh, apologies, <laughs> speaking over the boss. Uh, we were really surprised that we didn't get much more um, of that um, bad debt flowing through the relief package that the networks uh, put together. Um, I suppose we were expecting there to be a, a much bigger impact. I think it's a reflection of how well um, some of the government um, responses have, have acted in keeping people, you know, cash flow positive and able to pay their bills. You know, I don't uh, know and I don't think anyone's got the crystal ball to tell us exactly how bad it's going to get as those wind off. Uh, but I do think the toughest times in some in some cases um, in terms of bill payment are probably ahead of us. Yeah. And look, I, I agree with that in that we, we were more surprised at the lack of take up uh, on, on the various deferrals and rebates. Um, 
and we put that down to the government programs being effective. Uh, it's when they come off and the uh, res full recession impact becomes more real, um, we'll see more. And that's when we need to step up. <laughs> and yep. I, that that's a real question for us in terms of um, the expectation of planning being done, because I think that is going to come. And our question is, what is the industry doing to anticipate it and take proactive action rather than wait for it to happen and then um, try and pick up the pieces? Yeah, and I think the the major proactive is an extension of the rebate and the deferral schemes. Um, that's that's there, mm. uh, and it's sort of laying dormant, I suppose, uh, ready to to trigger if required. Um, if the the it's more of a cascading failure of um, bad debt leading to retailer failures. Um, again, that's the mechanisms are there to manage that. But are the mechanisms and the safety nets there? Um, the answer, I don't have a clear answer to that other than I don't think they are. I think through, data, through the data you collect, you're probably a part of the early warning system, though. And I think there's an important role to play there. No, look, I agree, Andrew. And we're, you know, it's a shame we don't have the sort of smart meter rollout and therefore that real time data right across our patch. Um, and no, Victoria's lucky in that respect. Um, and we will be, if this pandemic occurs in five years' time, we will be in a much better position. Um, <laughs> once, once in five year pandemic. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I totally agree with you. The, the sort of consumption data and the demand data um, that we get uh, is a real canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost unique in what yeah. you see, you know, inside people's and businesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. agree. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, so unless Cassandra or Andrew have any other urgent questions, uh, I'm afraid we will have to call it a day. Um, but thank you. That's been very, very useful and very informative. Um, and just very quickly, if you had to, if you were in our position, what are the couple of key things that you would expect to see in our report for this year, do you think? Um, I would be very keen to see those forward-looking things. Like the, that's yes, we've done sort of acknowledge what's happened and and what's changed, um, but equally, what are the key things that need to really shift up and step up? And and I do think it's that uh, forward-looking aspects associated with uh, the resilience and building trust in the industry, and that goes to coordination. Uh, and effectiveness and just an ongoing emphasis for that. Secondly, I would actually focus on the vulnerable customers. Um, I, I think the tail matters uh, and we need to focus on those customers and I think that should be a focus of the Charter. I also think you as a group should actually step back and may, I don't want to say pat yourselves on the back, but there, it's a, a role that wasn't there before that is there now and acknowledgement of it is a good thing. Mm. Uh, and you should be rewarded for that. Mm. Well, I can't think of a better place to stop. <laughs> well, congratulations. So, look, thank you very much for your time. That has been very useful. And uh, we will um, see you again after our report is finalised. Sensational. And again, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.